Prolegomena to a Tentative Realism by Evander Bradley McGilvery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prolegomena to a Tentative Realism by Evander Bradley McGilvery. In an article recently published in this journal, footnote, The Stream of Consciousness, Volume 4, page 225, end footnote, I tried to show that psychology presupposes an awareness distinct from the objects of awareness, and that this awareness is aware of itself as aware, as well as aware of what are usually called objects. In some subsequent article, I hope to examine the arguments brought forward to disprove the existence of such an awareness. But meanwhile, I shall assume that there is such a thing as awareness distinct from objects, and proceed to examine the bearing of this fact, provisionally assumed, upon the tenability of realism. Let me begin with a typical experience. Suppose that while I am having an experience of red, say of a postage stamp on my desk, my attention is distracted by a disturbance outdoors, and that I turn my head away from the desk to look out the window. Meanwhile, a friend with whom I have been discussing the stamp keeps his eyes fixed on it. Presently, I return to the interrupted discussion, look again toward the desk, and thus get the red a second time as object of awareness. And when I do so, I am also aware that there has been an interval during which the red has not been an object of consciousness. My friend, however, informs me that he has been examining the stamp all the time that I was diverted by the dogfight. In view of his assurance, I now think of the red as having been a fact in his experience when it was not in mine. It existed as red when it was not in my experience as one of the immediate objects of that experience. It was red in spite of the fact that it was not red for me, red for my awareness. I thus distinguish between red for my consciousness and red that was not for my consciousness, while yet it was red. The red existed in independence of my consciousness. Of course, in this case I have described, the red, while it was not found in my experience, was an object of another's experience. Now let us proceed to another case, where both that other person and I myself cease to see the red, and even to think of it. We, too, go out of the room, and as we depart, a third person enters, sees the stamp, and subsequently joining us, tells us what he saw. Still again, a fourth person reports to us that he saw the stamp when he was alone in the study, and that he has just come from the study, leaving no one behind. We begin conversation on other matters, and half an hour later someone says, but about that stamp, and enters upon a philatelic disquisition, which, as Mr. Kipling would say, is another story. Our present interest is in the red of that stamp during the half hour when, so far as anyone knows, no consciousness gave it a visible means of support. Was there any red in that interval? Or does the assertion that there was mean merely that if anyone had been in the study, there would have been a red for him? If I were to say that what can exist apart from my consciousness, and also apart from the consciousness of B, and of C, and of D, must also exist apart from all consciousness, I would be told that I was committing a gross fallacy. The rebuke would be deserved. And yet logic does not forbid us to conceive the possibility of the truth of a dictum simpliciter when the dictum secundum quid is true. It merely forbids the passage from the latter as premise to the former as foregone conclusion. The latter is not proved by the former, but surely no logician would dare say that it is disproved thereby. The truth of the dictum simpliciter remains an open question with a meaning. If so, why may I not say that there is meaning in the question whether the red of the stamp, when no one sees it, is still red? A thing that has a way of passing from one consciousness to another, and of presenting itself to several consciousnesses at the same time, arouses the suspicion of being independent of any consciousness. Footnote. To obviate misunderstanding at the outset, I wish to say that by independence I do not mean what Professor Royce understands the thoroughgoing realist to mean by independence. Professor Royce maintains that the resolute realist is committed to the view that if a meteor is real in his realistic sense, its mass, extension, or other primary qualities 
would remain real if there never were any knowledge in the world. The World and the Individual, first series, page 200. This may be true of certain realisms, but in regard to such I agree with Professor Royce that if their realistic definition of being is simply and rigidly applied, it destroys its own entire realm, denies its own presuppositions, and shows us as its one unquestionable domain the meaningless wilderness of absolute nothingness. But the realism which I am trying to study out in its ultimate implications is not a realism that tells us what would be the character of a world in which there is no consciousness anywhere throughout its whole temporal and spatial extent. It speaks of this world of ours, which has consciousness in it, seemingly as a function of certain brain states. By the independence of an object, I do not mean that the object would exist if this world were mindless from start to finish assuming there be start or finish. If this world were from everlasting to everlasting without mind as a constituent part of it, it would be so different from what it is that I do not know whether with the absence of mind there might not also be the absence of everything else. At any rate, the most confident assurance I can allow myself to entertain about such a world is that in it there would be no realist to make absurd philosophical statements in unreal conditional propositions, and no Professor Royce to point out these absurdities with consummate dialectical skill. Definitively, therefore, I refuse to discuss the philosophy of such a mindless world. If I were so foolish, Professor Royce would in this world show up the folly, as folly goes in this world, for his dialectic in this matter is relentless. In this paper I am speaking of this world, where I believe that there are minds, or consciousnesses, at least in spots, and where the question is whether there are any objects existing in other spots. More specifically, the independence spoken of in this paper is temporal independence, not absolute independence. By temporal independence, again, I mean existence at a time when there is no awareness of what thus exists. Of course, what is thus temporally independent is, in another sense, temporally dependent, i.e. in the sense that being in the same time, though not at the same time, there is relation between the awareness existing at one time and the object existing at another time, which relation can be expressed in terms of logical dependence. I venture to think that such a conception of being does not fall under any one of the four historical conceptions of being, which Professor Royce discusses with such power and persuasiveness. But at the same time, I believe that this conception of being is an historical conception, older than any of the others, and more persistent. Perhaps it is too naive to be treated of in Gifford lectures. End footnote. But, of course, the opponent of realism will not let me off so easily. He would reply that I beg the whole question in saying that the same object presents itself to several consciousnesses and passes from one consciousness to another. He would say that it is of the very essence of red to be perceived. Red is a perception, and nothing but a perception, and that is the end of it. Its essay is per kippy, and there are as many reds as there are awarenesses of it. The obvious reply to such a statement is that saying so does not make it so. The view that the essay of color is per kippi is not prima facie the true view. The plain man, unsophisticated by science and by philosophy, does not see in the essence of red anything that involves the necessity of its being perceived in order to be. Of course, the plain man's view is not final in this matter any more than in any other matter. But his naive attitude shows that it is a perfectly possible feat of thought to regard red as capable of independent existence, and that there is nothing in red as it is seen which points incontrovertibly to its subjectivity. The belief in the subjective character of red is a thing that has had a history, and fortunately we can examine the reasons that have led to the present widespread opinion among scientists and philosophers that red cannot be read except when there is an awareness of it. In one important point, the matter is on all fours with the Copernican theory of astronomy. This theory is not proved these days by saying that it is the essence of the sun to be the center of the solar system, nor is it proved by saying that all learned people believe it to be the center of that system. The theory is proved by just the very arguments that have led the learned to their belief. 
Any one is at liberty to examine these arguments, and if he sees a flaw in them, he can afford to dispute the conclusion. Fortunately, the same thing is true of the arguments for the subjectivity of colors and temperatures and everything else that is now the fashion to regard as definitively subjective. The arguments are matters of history, known and read of all men. If these arguments are not cogent, then no appeal to the essence of red as a mere perception or to the common belief of the initiated will convince anyone who is not joined to the idols of essential forms or to the idols of the marketplace. These arguments I propose to examine in subsequent articles, but before doing this, I wish to do two things. First, to examine two sophistries which have been very common in discussions of realism. Second, to discuss the possible meanings of the term sensation and to fix these meanings by the use of distinctive terms so that unnecessary confusion may not result in the treatment of what is at best an intricate problem. The first sophistry that I wish to expose is that which attributes to the realist the assumption of two numerically different objects, the perceived object and the unperceived object, lying forever beyond the field of awareness. I think that I have shown that except for those who will appeal, as to a final tribunal, to the essence of red as involving its presence to awareness, there is meaning in the question whether red can exist when not perceived. Now I wish to say that it is not necessary to suppose that if such a conceivable red really exists when unperceived, it must exist double when perceived, once as the perceived red and once as the unperceived red. Of course, if the red that is perceived is merely a perception and cannot exist except in consciousness, then any red which one might conceive as existing beyond the perceived red would necessarily be a second red, numerically distinct from the perceived red. The perceived red could at best be only a duplicate or copy of the red that is out of the mind. But we must not mix up what would follow if red is merely a perception with what would follow if red should prove to be an independent reality. This confusion is constantly met with in the writings of those who argue against the independent reality of perceived qualities. Thus Barclay, in one of his arguments for idealism, assumes that the realist maintains that though the ideas themselves do not exist without the mind, yet there may be things like them whereof they are copies or resemblances which things exist without the mind in an unthinking substance. Footnote. A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge, Section 8. End footnote. In refutation of such a contention, Barclay says that an idea can be like nothing but an idea. A color or figure can be like nothing but another color or figure. If we look but never so little into our own thoughts, we shall find it impossible for us to conceive a likeness except only between our ideas. Again, I ask whether those supposed originals or external things of which our ideas are the pictures or representations be themselves perceivable or no. If they are, then they are ideas and we have gained our point. If you say they are not, I appeal to anyone whether it be sense to assert a color is like something which is invisible, hard or soft like something which is intangible, and so of the rest. Footnote. A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge, Section 8. End footnote. Professor Strong argues in a similar matter in opposition to the realist. He thinks that for the realist there are really two material worlds, one accessible to touch and vision, and another lying concealed behind it. It cannot but strike us that worlds here have been multiplied praetor necessitatum. Footnote. Why the mind has a body. Page 178. End footnote. It does look that way on this representation, but the multiplication has been performed by the idealist in his inability to see anything but through the distorted lens of his idealism. There is surely another course open, lying between the doctrine that everything that is perceived is a modification of consciousness, and beyond such modifications of consciousness there is nothing, and the doctrine that everything that is perceived is a modification of consciousness, and beyond these modifications there is something like them in quality, but forever inaccessible to consciousness. It is perfectly permissible to conceive the object of vision as being not a modification of consciousness at all, but as the real thing, 
In this case, there is no duplication of worlds, praetor necessitatum. This is the view of the naive man, and as we have seen, there is nothing antecedently improbable in it. It may prove to be a mistaken view, but there is no contradiction in the terms of it. This third course is generally completely ignored by idealists. They assume that there is no question that our perceptions are states of consciousness and therefore ideal. Now, if consciousness is to be distinguished from its objects, as I have maintained, then it is improper to call the objects of consciousness in perception, or any other objects of consciousness for that matter, a state of consciousness. There are no states of consciousness in any proper sense of the term. Consciousness is always similar in character, whatever be its objects. Consciousness does not change its character from what it is when a sense quality is its object to become another kind of consciousness when later there is an emotional reaction upon this sense quality. It remains the same qualitatively similar consciousness throughout the time within which qualitatively different objects are presented to it. What is usually called a state of consciousness is either an object of consciousness or a state of such object. It may very well be that some of the objects exist only when there is an awareness of them. For instance, we have no reason for supposing that pleasure ever exists except as there is an awareness of it. But this does not make pleasure a state of consciousness, any more than the fact that color does not exist except as it is extended makes color a state of extension. Now those objects of consciousness which can exist, so far as we know only as there is an awareness of them, we may call subjective. Other objects, which there is reason for believing to exist when there is no awareness of them, we may call objective. But we may not argue that because these two classes of objects are alike in being objects of consciousness when we are aware of them, therefore what is true of the one class, namely its subjectivity, is also true of the other class. This is exactly what is done when we call everything a state of consciousness, and then suppose that we have proved idealism true. Footnote. Of course, there is need of further discussion as to the nature of consciousness as it is treated in the above remarks. For instance, consciousness is an abstraction, but it is none the less real for being so. Color is an abstraction. But I do not think that any man in his senses has ever supposed that this fact abolishes color out of the universe. But into these matters we must not go here. End footnote. Now if idealist would only bear in mind that realism can regard things as indeed at times objects of consciousness without thereby becoming states of consciousness, they would save themselves the trouble of constructing a fallacious dilemma with a view to impaling realist upon one of its horns. But they will not bear this in mind, and hence they keep on saying in complacent self-satisfied tone, the same red cannot be both in and out of consciousness. But the red we see is admittedly in consciousness. Therefore, if there is a real red independent of consciousness, it must be another red. For how can the red we see be at the same time the red we do not see? If they would only stop their iterations and reiterations long enough to give themselves time to examine the realist position, they would see that all they are saying amounts to the assertion that if the realist would only concede to the idealist the truth of the idealistic contention, then the realist could not consistently maintain something that is at variance with the conceded truth. The idealist thus begs the question as naively as ever the plain man does, whom the idealist despises so much. The idealist assumes that the red we see cannot be independent of the seeing, which is, of course, the pointed issue. And then he finds it easy to prove that if there is an independent red, it must be a numerically different thing from the red we do see. Now it can be easily seen that if the idealist would only treat the realist conception as he would treat anything else, he would never say, as Professor Strong says, if we start from the realistic assumption of an object existing independently of consciousness, the conclusion to which we are driven is that this object and our perception of it are distinct and separate things. There are really, on this assumption, two candles, the candle that is extra-mentally real and the candle that is a mental modification. They differ in a variety of ways, one being permanent, the other transient, one made of matter, the other of mind stuff, etc., being distinct and separate, each can exist without the other. Footnote. Appara Cittato, page 185. End footnote. On this principle, 
Mr. Strong is professor of psychology, and Mr. Strong is playing golf for two gentlemen. They differ in a variety of ways, one being permanent and the other transient, one addressing his classes, the other addressing his ball, etc. Being distinct and separate, each can exist without the other. Now Locke expressly duplicated the object, but Professor Strong gives us no warning that he is dealing with realism of the Lockean type alone. He represents realism as being in general, especially in its naive form, unqualifiedly committed to duplicating the object. It is only because Professor Strong supposes that the realist would cheerfully make certain idealistic admissions that the duplication of objects is foisted on the realist. But the idealist returns to the fray when he has been foiled in his attempt to down the realist with this sophistry. But he only brings another sophistry to accomplish what the first failed to accomplish. He tries his hand at another misinterpretation of his opponent's position. The realist will surely be kind enough to admit that if we see the independent red, then that red is both in and out of consciousness at the same time. That it is in consciousness when it is seen, no one can doubt. And that it is out of consciousness is just the gist of the realist's contention. The realist, even at the risk of seeming unaccommodating, refuses to admit that the real red he is contending for is both in and out of mind at the same time and in the same sense. When the real red is in consciousness, it is in consciousness, and when it is out of consciousness, it is out of it. Its independence of the mind only means that it is not necessary for it to be in the mind in order to be at all, and also that while it is in one mind, it may also be in another. The independent thing does not exhaust all its being in being perceived by one mind. Put this way, there is no more contradiction in the assertion that the same object can be both in and out of mind at the same time than in the assertion that the same person can be father and son at the same time. The particular respect in which a man is father is not the same particular respect in which he is son. So the particular respect in which red is in consciousness is not the same particular respect in which it is not in consciousness. As Bradley has well observed, Contradictions exist so far only as internal distinction seems impossible, only so far as diversities are attached to one unyielding point assumed, tacitly or expressly, to be incapable of internal diversity or external complement. And there is only one way to get rid of contradiction, and that way is by dissolution. Instead of one subject distracted, we get a larger subject with distinctions, and so the tension is removed. Footnote, Appearance and Reality, pages 566 to 567 and 192. End footnote. The idealist maintains that the realist red is one unyielding point, while the realist maintains that his red, like anything else we can think of, may be capable either of internal diversity or of external complement, may be a larger subject with distinctions. There are other sophistries frequently appearing in the course of arguments for idealism, but I think that those I have mentioned are the most common and the most generally overlooked. Professor Strong's writings will convince anyone that the idealist can get intense satisfaction in rolling them as sweet morsels under his tongue. Let us now proceed to examine the distinctions I refer to as necessary to be recognized before at least one kind of realism can be understood and intelligently estimated. There is no word in modern philosophical literature which is more ambiguous than the word sensation, and yet many writers use it with as much confidence in its constancy of meaning as the geometrician reposes in the symbol pi. Thus Professor Strong says in one place that if it were possible for us to know that objects exist whether perceived or not, we might know them to be independent of the mind, and they could not then be composed of sensation. Footnote. This journal, volume 1, page 549, italics mine. End footnote. Here it is arbitrarily assumed that sensations can mean only one thing, namely the modification of consciousness, which accompanies the brain event initiated by an external stimulus applied to a sense organ. If this be merely a matter of words, it is not worth spending our time on it. But opponents of realism often use the fact that sensation means for them just sense qualities while appearing in consciousness as a kind of sacred and inspired revelation that what we are aware of in such sensation must be subjective. 
They apply the hagiograph sensation to a thing, and forthwith the thing becomes ideal in its nature. Reality is in its mental temple. Let all the realistic world keep silence. This is just what such words as these imply. Sensation presents to us an object that is real and present, but that object is not distinct from the sensation. Footnote. This journal, volume 1, page 549. As in many other hagiographa, we have here a sentence that charms the ear with its mystery of meaninglessness and assumption of unfathomable profundity. If it could be interpreted by ordinary standards, it would mean the object presents to us an object that is real and present, or sensation presents to us a sensation that is real and present. This, of course, would be flat. Hence, we must begin by distinguishing sensation and object in order to get a giver and a gift, and then we cancel the distinction in order to get idealism. End footnote. It is not thus that a great psychologist writes of sensation. When we adults talk of our sensations, we mean one of two things. Either certain objects, namely simple qualities or attributes like hard, hot, pain, or else those of our thoughts in which acquaintance with these objects is least combined with knowledge about the relations of them to other things. Footnote, James, Principles of Psychology, Volume 2, Page 3. End footnote. According to this statement, which seems to me to express the truth in the matter, there are at least two things to be distinguished in every sensation of an adult. There is a sensum, quality or attribute, and there is a sentire, thought, as Professor James calls it. I should prefer to call it awareness. Not that in sensation these facts are separate. They exist together in a concrete unity, wherein they can be distinguished. They are two aspects of an undivided whole. Now, if this be so, I think we should, for the sake of clearness, recognize that sensation may mean not merely sensum and not merely sentire, but also the whole of which sensum and sentire are aspects. Sensation, therefore, means also sentire sensum. Over against this, and with explicit rejection of this distinction, Professor Strong maintains that the object is not distinct from sensation. Footnote. So Barclay maintained that, in truth, the object and the sensation are the same thing and cannot, therefore, be abstracted from each other. Treatise, section 5. End footnote. From sensation in what sense? Obviously, in the sense of sensum. Obviously, not in the sense of either sentire or of sentire sensum. But the dictum once uttered is forthwith used as an axiom in the obviously not sense. Of course, if no distinction can be made between sensum and sentire, then Professor Strong's identification of sensation with sensum and his ignoring everything else are justified. Professor Strong says that he regrets he cannot recognize the distinction. The contention then narrows down to a question of fact. Is there a clearly recognizable distinction between sensum and sentire? I have tried, in an article already mentioned, to show that the distinction is obvious. In a later article, I shall try to show that, unless the distinction is recognized, any attempt to understand the world of experience lands one in absurd paradoxes. Meanwhile, I will leave the matter to the discrimination of the reader. Now, if it is proper to distinguish sensum, sentire, and sentire sensum, the realist maintains that these distinctions give an intelligible realistic meaning to the term Professor Strong uses so frequently, namely possible sensation. If sensa are sense qualities or attributes like hard or soft, then why may not sensibilia be just these same sense qualities when existing apart from any sentire? If sensum is a sense datum, then why may not sensibile be sense dandum? And why may not such a dandum exist before it becomes a datum, much as a toy which I buy a week before Christmas exists as a dandum until Christmas Eve, when it becomes a datum? This change from dandum to datum does not make the toy any more real. Its nature has not changed, its reality has not changed, in ceasing to be a mere dandum and becoming a datum. The only change is in the relation to the lad.' 
So the realist maintains that red may be real before it is given or presented to any sentire as a sensum. If this contention be valid, then just as the toy quad dandum and the toy quad datum are the same toy at different times and in different relations, so the sensibile and the sensum may be the same quality at different times and in different relations. Resuming our results, we may say that the term sensation is an omnibus term, meaning either sensum or sentire or sentire sensum, or even sensible, the last when we speak of possible sensation. We shall need these distinctions kept clearly in mind in our further study of realism as a tenable theory. End of Prolegomena to a Tentative Realism by Evander Bradley McGilvery